I'd expect nothing else. Do <laughs> when was that Saturday night? Yeah, it was Saturday. That was the better weather, wasn't it? A little coronation party. Inadvertently, yes. Yeah, <laughs> it wasn't the uh, topic of the day, but no. I think good bit of weather, good bit of company, some good food. Yeah, can't beat it. Yeah. I was on DIY detail over the weekend. I was oh, painting, painting the spare room, so I Paint. literally chose to watch paint dry rather than watch the coronation. I swear every bank holiday weekend is painting. It's always painting. For me. That's the age that we have reached, my Yeah. Friend. That's the age that we have reached. But let's pit off middle age for a little while yeah. and get stuck in, shall we? Yeah. Um, hello, folks. Welcome back. Episode 6 Taking Stock After the Bell with me, as ever. Dave Henry, investment manager this week. I am delighted to be joined by the very, very knowledgeable James Hardy, investment manager. How are you keeping, mate? You well? Yeah, very well, thank you, yeah. Super, super. Um, let's get stuck in then. So, obviously talking about the coronation coming off the back of a long weekend. I thought this was fun from the FT. Uh, they have a little chart showing what FTSE companies looked like the top companies in the index, the UK market in 1953, and compared that to today. Do you want to take a punt at what the the top company was in the 100 back in the day? God, it's well before my time. Uh, gosh, it's be... still in the index now. Still in the index now. I mean, HSBC, Shell, Shell, of course. Shell, Shell. We've got a few in there actually. Uh, Shell, um, Anglo Iranian Oil, which became. BP, of course. There's a couple of names in there. It just shows you some of these companies have been in, been in the index for not just decades, but you know, almost 100 years now, isn't that? That's 70 years. So amazing. Yeah. It shows you longevity. Exactly. I mean, you know, there's always a flashy sales pitch for the next greatest idea, but actually, if you just go over the stalwarts, sometimes you can find a real gem. Absolutely. I mean, it would be nice to have known 70 years ago what were go- companies were going well, to be in the index exactly. in, in 70 years' time, but that's the trick, isn't it? That's what we were trying to do. Um, so, obviously, we had quite a busy week last week. Um, Fed minutes, 10th uh, rate rise in a row. So, the Fed funds rate is now at 5 to 5 mm. and a quarter percent. Um, noticeable, I think, for what wasn't said as much as what was said. Um, there was an emission in the minutes afterwards uh, which had been in previous uh, minutes saying that the committee anticipates some additional policy firming may be appropriate for the Fed to achieve its 2% inflation goal. That sentence was cut and Jerome Powell even referenced the fact that that was a minute during his press conference. Uh, in short, I think we have seen the last interest rate rise. Yep. You know, if you look at the futures market, what they're pricing in for the rest of the year, they're talking about uh, a very low probability of a rate rise from here. It's basically locked on that the next meeting will be flat from here. Mm-hmm. And then by the end of the year, they're talking about it being maybe a percent lower than where it is today. So I, I think, is this the pivot? I think so. I think it's probably in the books. I think the last one's in the books. I mean, would it kill them just to stop and pause? I oh, know, yeah. I mean, they talk about higher for longer, but you know, we're always talking about where they'll end up. But actually, they could just go nowhere. And that would be a real shock for the market because the market is pricing in the cut. So if they just stay where they're at, I think, you know, your growth stocks could take another hammering. Yeah, really? I mean, yeah, but we're surely just delaying the inevitable, I think, in the term of the path of interest rates. But what we'll see, it's all about expectations, as we've said many, many, many times. But there was a chart we threw up a couple of weeks ago um, with the pace of interest rate rises in the States, and it's, it's been the quickest basically you've gone from zero yeah, to hundred exactly. in the blink yeah. of an eye and this is not only well i said a moment ago this is the 10th rate rise that we've had in a row so we've covered a lot of ground in a quick space of time mm. i don't think it would i just think just pause and see see where we get to personally yeah. but i am not a central banker um speaking of central banks got bank of england this week yeah good old b of a and yeah. we'll probably just follow in follow in yeah, the fed's exactly. footsteps i would have thought and expected that there's another pretty quarter point in the books isn't it yeah yeah Exactly. We'll see. Um, something you sent me before this, James, which some really, really good work, um, is our first chart here up on the screen. Um, do you want to just talk us through this when we're talking about rates? I think this is a nice point to sort of seg you into that. Yeah, so look, the, the elephant in the room is the massive pile of debt that we've accumulated over decades. And I just thought I'd put together a couple of charts to illustrate this. So 
over the last 15 years, since 2008, we've been in a world of ultra-low interest yeah. rates, right? And if you look at the debt that's due to redeem in the future that was issued in the last 15, are we going to pay it off or are we going to refinance it? Now, I would say we're probably going to refinance it, right? But it's going to be at higher rates. So you can see here you've got a few hundred billion quid due over the next few years. And then if you just pop onto the next slide, if you want yeah, to mind, sure. the OBR is again forecasting that we're still going to be borrowing over 100 billion quid. Yeah. Now, it's lower than forecast, but nevertheless, it's still net borrowing. So look, then, at, look, at the, look at that move in 2020. Yeah, it's crazy. And that's wartime response, right? Yeah. And actually, if you roll up all of those cumulative borrowing, and then, what was it, stick it as a proportion of GDP, we're at 100%. That's our next one, isn't it, here? Yeah, so, here we can see. It's, next chart. It's just, the, the numbers are staggering. They're, they're truly staggering. And if you, if you imagine, you know, we're holding up, like, a, you know, Atlas, with the Atlas mount on, on it. Currently, it's like a balloon. It's just filled with air. That's when interest rates are really low. But what's been going on with rates going up is that balloon is converting into a lead balloon. So it's only going like to get... like your jokes. Oh, always. <laughs> yeah, they don't pay me for my jokes, that's for sure. Um, so that debt servicing yeah. on that massive mountain is only going to get more and more expensive. So really, are they going to keep rates at these levels or not? I think they're going to cut them. Taking a back a step, looking at that chart there that's on screen at the moment. There's two ways to get that bar chart done. Yeah. Pay off your debt. And what do we know about politicians? They do not do like raising yeah. taxes because it, it's a vote loser and it actually requires some long-term thinking, Yeah. Uh, which, let's be honest, they're not incentivized to think long-term. Yeah. The other way to get that bar chart down is to grow and get percentage or get GDP up. Yeah. Now, if I'm Liz Truss sat here, <laughs> I've gone, well, well, we tried that. <laughs> we tried a, a, a growth stimulative budget and the market peaked it. Yeah, I mean... It, the, the, the counter-argument to all this is that productivity will go up with the advent of technology and yada, yada, yada. I, I, I'll believe it when I see it. I look at the numbers and I think, oh, crikey, that's a lot to pay back. If interest rates stay this high for this long, it's going to be very expensive to service. So my, my sort of, I remember this conversation with clients two or three years ago. You know, if we don't get inflation out the back of the response to COVID, we're never going to get it. And you can throw all your economics test textbooks yeah. in the bin because we had, you know, I remember when I started my career, the thinking was we're printing money that's going to lead to hyperinflation that never actually arrived. Mm. But when you had the fiscal stimulus on top of the monetary stimulus, i.e. putting money in people's pockets, that's where the inflation came along and chuck in a little sprinkle of supply chain bottleneck issues oh, yeah. and, and it exacerbates the whole thing. So, you know, we had an inflationary shock, basically, which does in real terms, reduce the value of, of some of that debt. Of course. You know, one of the best inflation hedges you can have is a whacking great big mortgage because yeah. if inflation goes exactly. up 10% and you're fixed at three or four in the new world, actually that mortgage is becoming cheaper. Yeah, but you just have to hope that your earnings go up with inflation. Otherwise, if your earnings are flatline, you yeah. still lose. Which is what I think we're seeing this percentage of GDP. So we'll stick with this, skip on from that one. The final chart here is is the balance sheet of the UK, right? Well, I mean, scary. there's a lot of red bars here, and this is a this is a scary chart. So give us a little bit of context here, James. Yep. So this is a very broad measure of the public sector's net worth. So it's very simply assets minus liabilities, and you can see after two thousand and eight, yeah. we've just gone down the hole ever further and further. So if you know if if we were playing by these rules, I mean. Gosh, you know, that the banks would repossess our homes instantly. I mean, it's just, you know, they, they play by a totally different rule book when they control the money supply and the tax collection. It's yeah. just, it's bonkers. Mine is 600 billion quid. Human beings, I think human nature is a little bit like water. It always looks for the path of least resistance, I think. Mm. And given the option of improving productivity, growing our way out of the debt that we've accumulated, or raising taxes, with which the first one might be difficult, second one is unpopular for the vast majority of the country, third, 
try and keep rates low. You know, I, th- I would agree with you. I think there's only one solution here that's palatable, and that's the easiest one, which mm. is which is get rates down from where we are today. Um, Quite, yeah. I think the market's pretty, actually to a certain extent, ex- expecting a lot of these rate cuts to happen and rate easing, easing to happen, which is a very, very dangerous position to get yourself get yourself in. I wrote something about this a couple of weeks ago that, you know, you, if you're making fundamental investment decisions based on, on what central bankers do, then you probably need an investment well, strategy, exactly. right? I mean, you know, they barely know what's going on as well. I mean, I, I like to think of it as uh, the double pendulum thing. So if you've got yeah. the pendulum going about its merry business like this, and then you attach another pendulum to the bottom of the first and plot how that moves, mm. it's all over the place. So the analogy for inflation and the central bankers is they're trying to control inflation, which is the second pendulum, by controlling the first. And I just think it's very difficult to do. Yeah. Oh, oh I mean, they've got a really, really difficult job, um, and I think so at the moment, because you're caught between the pressures that we've discussed, I let's keep rates low, but also you've got an inflationary issue, which still, at least in the United Kingdom, hasn't hasn't yet gone away. Um, just before we leave rates, two things. Um, again, wrote about this a couple of weeks back. Um, theory of a, of a rate cut pivot or a pause, at least, being bullish for equities. Um, we went and looked at the numbers. What you can see here on screen is for the US stock market, uh, six months before the final rate hike, which we may or may not have seen from the Fed, and then subsequent 12 month performance. Um, this is the same chart, exactly the same chart, but for the Bank of England with rate rises and the UK market in respect of, of equity market performance. I, I, I don't think there's a lot here. I don't think there's a lot here. I mean, this is a really noisy chart. I yeah, mean, it's not an obvious trend, is there? No, and the point is, I suppose, that if you're waiting for a final rate rise to get invested, then sure, you know. The, the average 12 month return after the final rate rises in the books is a little bit better than the average. I yeah. think it's 2% more in, in the States and, and maybe 5% more historically in the UK. But those dispersion of outcomes are so wide, I don't think you can use that. Oh, exactly. I mean, it all depends on the nature of the rate cut as well, because if you've got the economy falling off the cliff and it's an emergency rate cut, well, that almost guarantee well, this is this is final rate rise but it's the same point isn't it yeah. because you might have made the final rate rise had expected more and then oh god yeah there's a major major economic incident so actually we can't we can't raise but um absolutely right what we didn't see behind either, each of these lines is causation yeah um and that's obviously going to again if we knew where the economy was going and by extent earnings maybe we would have an idea but yeah. we don't so we don't yeah um final thing on rates and and this wasn't in this wasn't in the packs so this is the first curveball uh skipped in building society announced today 100 percent mortgages are back oh my word the good times are back um i've got maybe <laughs> i've got maybe a controversial view on this so i don't hate this Maybe it's being Irish and love and death. I, do, I don't hate this. Um, you're going to have to put up two years worth, or I think three years worth of proof that you've actually made rental payments and, and met your rental obligations. Right. It sounds to me like there's actually some sensible digging done behind this. You know, if I'm, if I'm a renter and I've been able to meet my obligations month in, month out, and I've got an impe- impeccable credit record and I don't necessarily have a fairly large bank of mum and dad to tap into... I don't hate this. I really don't. It all makes sense on paper, but then isn't housing just a function of credit supply? So if everyone can borrow because they all have zero deposit but a good track record, why doesn't the market just melt up? Because supply hasn't changed. But you're allowing more and more people to buy in because they're all borrowing 100%. What... This is crazy. Surely this is absolutely bonkers. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not so sure. Well, listen, we'll see how it plays out. But I think ultimately, the the issue with supply hasn't gone away. Mm. You're absolutely right. I just have a bit of an issue at the moment where we mentioned it in a previous episode where the answer to almost every single question seems to be to prop up the housing market, and that mm. does leave people behind. And this at least gives some people who are seemingly credit worthy an opportunity to get on the ladder. I don't know a huge amount about Skipton Building Society, maybe you do, but I don't think they're going to be funding 
Maybe, but, you know... Billions of mortgages. So given my recent, you know... Maybe re- I know, maybe another maybe other banks follow suit, but maybe. it's quite niche at the moment, and I'm sure there's quite a lot of, there's will, a lot of I, checks and balances. I would be very scared if this became a mainstream product. I mean, you look at what happened in Japan and the property bubble it had. What they ended up doing was trying to get more and more people to buy property they just lengthen the term of the mortgage. So, you know, they were having mortgages that, you know, your children could inherit, and all it did was inflate the asset value. It didn't actually solve the underlying issue. Mm. I'd be very concerned for the very people that this is trying to help. And look, it helped to buy. Help to buy caused these houses that the people they're trying to help to buy, they've made even more difficult to buy. Uh, I'm very sceptical. Well, glad you mentioned that, because apparently Help the Buy is coming back as well. Um, <laughs> moving on, uh, taking a hard left turn. <laughs> uh, feels actually a lifetime ago now, but it's since it's since the last pod, so so we'll touch on it. Uh, tech earnings. Um, I think, you know, obviously, so tech companies, Microsoft and Apple, would be the two, the two most important stocks in the world. Microsoft destroyed on earnings, um, particularly Azure, which is the cloud computing division, up by 31%, expected to grow 27% over the next year in, in a recession, in inverted commas. Um, Google had really good results there, although there was a bit of weakness from YouTube. I don't know if you've tried to watch YouTube recently. I find it absolutely unwatchable. Um, maybe that's because I don't pay up for the premium. Yeah. <laughs> um, a meta as well, you know, is another name that I think it's worth worth touching on. The artist known as, uh, formerly known as Facebook. Um, you know, given how strong the market, given how much of the market strength this year has been derived from technology, this was a big earnings round for tech. Oh, absolutely huge. I mean, these juggernauts, they just keep on powering on, don't they? I mean, every quarter their earnings are, yeah. The amount of free cash flow these companies are generating is in the tens of billions of dollars. Yeah. I mean, it's absolutely gargantuan the scale of these things. And, you know, Facebook in particular has been, what was it, one of the best tech stocks year to date. And you look After at... After being one of, the, one of the worst last well, year. Well, quite. I mean, you know, the, the mayor culpa that came out, you know, they're cutting spending on the metaverse. Zuckerberg is... Uh, giving away some control in the company, they're doing buybacks, job cuts. I mean, it's literally everything that the bulls wanted to see and the bears didn't want to see. Absolutely everything. I mean, he's put on a tie. He's stopped talking about the metaverse. Yeah. He's given the street exactly what they wanted, which was exactly. relative capital efficiency and capital discipline, and I get that. But the big thing for me with Meta's numbers was that they beat on revenue. Yeah. And you can't cut and make more efficiencies that that's where that shows up in earnings um if you're reducing costs you should be reducing revenue in theory and actually yeah. they beat on revenue so i think that's really encouraging for the stock and, and probably why we saw the main reason we saw a fairly big pop but um again it just shows you how quickly the narrative and these things turn around mm. meta you couldn't have given it away last year it's pivoted it's been one of the star performers as you said netflix would be another name in tech yeah. that Again, you know, growth slowing. Nobody's gonna pay for Netflix anymore. They've made everything they're ever gonna make. When and it's changed now. Yeah, I mean, nothing with the company itself changed. But again, we keep coming back to this. It's all about expectations, and when people are all on one side of the room, there's no left. There's no more room to go in that side. Mm-hmm. You know, the expectation that Netflix is X growth became baked in. So yeah. any upside surprise, suddenly you get this massive re-rating. Uh, absolutely. Um, we'll touch a wee bit more on expectations yeah. in a wee bit, but before I come on to that, or we come on to that, um, here's where we are with tech valuations. This is from our friends at, at Polar Capital, who we had in a couple of weeks ago. Um, this is tech valuation on an absolute basis on the left-hand side and versus the market on the right-hand side. Um, the new slide I share I have with this chart is that it includes the dot-com bubble, uh, you take out those valuations and, and current levels certainly feel a lot toppier. Um, I think the point is that they're making is, yes, tech is not cheap, and I don't think either of us would say, apart from the odd special situation that you get, maybe, yeah. but when you bake in the growth 
actually it's quite attractive so google google's one that you get the opportunity to buy cheaply the yeah. old time exactly because the narrative's a wee bit hairy at the moment because people are concerned about uh open ai versus board and maybe um the search business being being cap or being competed away it's on a cheaper valuation it's basically on a market valuation for double the growth of the market yeah 17 times for 17 percent yeah i mean when your very name becomes a verb i think you've you're onto a winner i think it's up to open ai chat gpt to prove that it can disrupt search before i believe that yeah so i'm quite keen on google at these levels because I, i'm i'm I just don't believe it. It might be the next best thing, chat GPT, it really might. But if I'm going to stop Googling, I don't know why I wouldn't Google yet. <laughs> if, if I want to just... It's inherently fun. It's ridiculous, isn't it? Yeah. It, it, is, it is true. Um, Counterpoint, Google's search business has very, very high margins. We estimate over 70%. I mean, capitalism shouldn't tolerate that, right? Yeah, I mean, they not only dominate the search, but they also dominate online advertising. Uh-huh. So they own basically every touch point on the value chain. You know, they've got the demand side, they've got the supply side, they've got the exchange that sits in the middle. You know, I think if those practices were regulated in the way that our industry is regulated, they go, oh, that's a bit of a conflict of interest, isn't it? So, I, they, yeah unassailable is how I would describe their position. Yeah. I mean, I, th- I think Google's a fabulous company on a, on a reasonable valuation and strikes me as a pretty good investment opportunity there. Yeah. Not investment advice, of course, <laughs> but um, I, think, I don't think it's the worst idea in the world. Um, expectations, right? Uh, the only reason, one of the only reasons I can find to be positive about the world in terms of markets at the moment is just how bad expectations are, how low expectations are, and where sentiment is at. Yeah. Um, so there are a bunch of charts here that are all saying the same thing. Uh, are you going to increase or decrease equity exposure in the coming days and weeks? Uh, the percentage planning to increase equity exposure, according to JP Morgan, is as low as it's been in the past couple of years. Um, where do you see, again from JP Morgan, where do you see S&P 500 at year end? survey of institutional investors um, over two thirds see it materially lower than where we're at today um, and finally uh, this is net overweight equities versus bonds so basically if you're below the x-axis there you're playing defense if you're above you're on the attack in terms of equity exposure and, and people are positioned very defensively and um, there aren't many more readings below where we are today um, the main notable ones are, are in and around the global financial crisis there so expectations rock bottom as you said this is an expectations game and actually if we get some good news in inverted commas or the world doesn't end maybe maybe there's a potential for a bit of a rip and, and maybe that's what we've been seeing year to date yeah i mean if you think that interest rates are going to go back down to this ultra low soggy rate rise world i yeah the argument for owning bonds is quite compelling, so I understand why it's negative. But equally, you know, your quality yeah, companies. That's a fair point. Your quality companies are still going to be grinding out quarter to quarter, year to year, decade to decade of just growth, and they'll just nail it. You know, you look at the price of Guinness, right? So we had a great slide from our friends over at Linzel Train when they came in to present the other month. They talked about the real price of Guinness over decades and it's up so many multiples you you wouldn't believe it so again a drink you know a very boring drink never changes you can't innovate it away but it outpaces so many things and you just think why do we worry about the short-term noise when the longer-term picture is just so rosy we worry about the short-term noise so we get punched in the face for that day in day out Right. And the industry doesn't help itself as I've as I've said in the past. Um yeah, you're absolutely right. That's fair that's a fair point with this chart actually is the pushing you're not seeing the pushing pill here either. Mm. There's one way to look at it, which is to say actually we're playing you know, people are concerned about the future at the moment and that's why the line is below the x axis, but actually bonds are giving you something for the first time in a very long time. Yeah. So 
they are more a more attractive asset class here and people are maybe happy to lock in four or five percent um we will see but expectations i think i think pretty low um we've been talking for a while about recession and, and i think that's why people are quite negative um the market i think is doing underneath the bonnet exactly what it should be doing the cyclical economic stuff is cheap but the steady boring stuff is relatively and absolutely quite expensive yeah. i think so this chart is showing you uh, valuations for consumer staple type stocks so I've picked four at random, uh, Coca-Cola, Procter & Gamble, Colgate, of course, good old toothpaste, mm. and Unilever, the only uh, the only UK there na- name there to give us an idea of, of what sort of discount there is for, for stocks in the UK market. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's what jumps out to me. I mean, you know, Coke, Procter & Gamble, Colgate, you know, yes, they all have different products, but it's similar underlying, you know, population growth trends, pricing increase, and... You know, Unilever's got exactly the same, but it's just lo- it's London listed and it yeah. trades at such a big <laughs> discount. Yeah, they're three and a half percent of MSCI World, aren't we? Mm. I think or four or something. Um, so it's an easy UK. Sadly, is, is an easy market to ignore. Probably if you're an international manager, but just just on this, you know, a client asked me the other day, if people are defensive, where does the money go? Mm. And it has to go somewhere, and it goes into these things, which yeah. are. You know, if I'm an equity manager and I've got to be long something, and I'm looking for somewhere to hide, probably Colgate isn't a isn't a terrible place. Yeah, to you know, you can always bet on people using toothpaste. And the funny thing with consumer brands is that they tend to be um, very brand loyal for what they put either on their body or in their body. Right. It, it, so, I I use Colgate toothpaste, right? I would never dream of using Sensodyne. The, it's the same You're a thing. Guy, I'm, a, I'm a Colgate guy, you know. You. <laughs> These pearly whites, you know, whew, a lot of work. Um, but, you know, I, I would never dream of using Sensodyne or any competitor. So Colgate it's for me, it, I would die with Colgate. You know, whew, it's a strong brand for me. But, you know, something that you put on your skin, say, makeup, um, again, those are also very... Uh, very brand loyal. Yeah. So I understand why they trade at premium, but come on, Unilever is such a big discount. Apple's a bit like this, isn't it? Yeah. And that's the discourse between is it a tech stock or is it a consumer staple? Or is it a luxury goods company? Yeah, exactly. Who knows? Um, did you see that Buffett quote recently? If I offered you $10,000 to never use an iPhone ever again, a lot of you wouldn't take it. <laughs> That's crazy. I know you wouldn't take it because that's pocket change. Yeah. Thing, mate, but <laughs> but ten, I mean, not, I think, yeah, the point is there, right? It's almost an attachment. People's, you know, you walk down the street in London, God above, everyone's bumping into each other because yeah. they've got the phone welded to their hand. And if you're talking about, you know, things, you know, consumer staples, actually, pretty Apple, pretty Apple is a staple now, but how do you value it? Um, it's just crazy when you think about the web they've spun and trapped the consumers in so if you have Hard anything it doesn't matter anymore yeah i remember like five six years ago wherever it, the focus was on how many handsets have they flogged and mm. that's completely the wrong thing to look at yeah because that is the gateway to their infrastructure you know ios is probably the best business one of the best businesses of all time they take 30 cents on every dollar that gets spent in the ads st- or in the app store yeah even if it is spent on a third party app so you now, there's won't... a lot of pushback against that, but that, that is an incredible business. It is, until the regulator goes, this is a joke. If they haven't done by now. Wow. It was like when they had um, Zuckerberg in for that congressional testimony, where they were asking, is WhatsApp an email? You know, they, yeah. these guys just don't know what they're doing. Yeah, I mean, there's a regulatory argument, I think, with the breakup of the tech companies that actually that might be bullish short term in terms of valuation and you extract some value from these businesses, but... Yeah, the sum of the parts for Google, for example, absolutely. Yeah, they, break it up, bring they, it on. They, they can't be allowed to, to grow to a size that is... Like they already have. Well, <laughs> probably, probably. Um, so, if you, know, you look at consumer staple valuations, tech, mega cap tech... Actually, I think people are looking for safety mm. pending a, an incoming recession. This is a similar chart. You know, small cap is outperforming large cap in the UK when when the chart is high, vice versa. When it's low, p- 
people want safety of large companies yeah. when you're going into an economic slowdown type environment. Um, again, cyclicals feed defensives. Defensives outperforming cyclicals at the minute as people position for for a pending pending recession. Um, I mean, there's bound to be some opportunities here, but it's a brave person goes and buys cyclicals and. If, if a recession is coming down the road, right? Yeah, same with small cap. I mean, from a stock perspective, you know, small caps are partly driven as a function of liquidity, more so than large cap. Uh, you know, you look at the AIM market, for example. I mean, when liquidity drives up, the market's just dead on its feet. Um, and certainly from the business perspective, small caps tend to be slightly riskier. You know, they might have more debt in their structure. Um, or they might not have been as long established. Um, so certainly they're the first to fall victim when banks don't want to lend to businesses anymore. It's to the small companies, they cut that loose first. So it, it takes a brave person to be buying small cap. But again, that previous chart there, the small versus large, when you get to these levels, small caps often do quite well. Yeah. But you'll never feel safe doing it at all. Well, that's, usually, that's, that's usually the sign of a good trade is when yeah. you feel a bit sick making it um, I was listening to a podcast with Cam Harvey recently who um, is the gentleman that discovered that the yield curve is a decent predictor of recessions yeah. well, yield curve inversions basically when short term interest rates are above long term interest rates which should not be the case but that is mm. I think predicted nine of the last nine recessions it's got them all and there's been zero false signals which yeah. is incredibly incredibly impressive um, one of his points was actually because the yield curve has become something that everyone looks at now right and because everyone expects a recession like this is a slow moving train mm. down the tracks that we can see coming if it does come Actually, that probably insulates you from the worst effects of a recession. And the example he gave was, you know, let's imagine you are chief executive of a listed company, and in 2009, you stand in front of a room full of shareholders and you say, man, this really caught us out of left field. We did not expect as deep an ugly a recession to arrive at all, and we've been caught offside. We're doing our best. Mel Kelpa, fine. If you stand up in front of a room of shareholders as chief executive in 2024 and go, oh man, we didn't see that coming, I'm sorry, we're caught offside completely, they're going to laugh you out of the room. Mm. So you're seeing companies take steps now to try and protect from the worst of a recession, and you're seeing layoffs, mainly in tech, to be honest, um, but you're starting to see measured layoffs and projects getting cancelled. And actually, if that recession does arrive and the slow-moving train does come in, then actually the recession probably isn't going to be as sharp as, as maybe people are fearing because of these, you know, it's been more gradual, I suppose. It's all a very good point. I mean, I just don't think anyone can predict anything with any real certainty. Yeah. So, you know, if the butterfly flaps its wings in one country, it causes a tornado in another, you know, these sorts of small movements but then they have a weird cumulative effect and then yeah. you chuck a wild card event into the mix it destabilizes everything I, yeah. I I think no one can really predict anything with much certainty other than the yield curve incredibly it's the one thing yeah, that seems but to be he, he, you know Cam Harvey fun, funnily enough actually wrote a piece at the beginning of the year saying that it, he thinks this is the first false signal Really, which was interesting. I mean, listen, who knows? And we we don't necessarily we spend a lot of time on the pod talking about macro, but we're not macro managers. We try to find decent companies and and stick with them over over extensive extended periods of time. But people do naturally focus on the big picture. But you're absolutely right. This stuff is really really hard to predict and infinitely complex systems. It's quite interesting. I mean, a lot of you know a lot of things feed on their own expectations. So for example, in an inflationary environment, it fuels its own inflation because you expect it to keep going up. So you buy, which causes the prices to go up, which makes people go, oh, inflation, better go buy. So expectations, again, it's really everything, and it's self-fulfilling. That's what's truly incredible about this dynamic environment we find ourselves in. I just want to finish up with one thing because I know you're a very keen 
investor, enthusiastic investor, something that caught my eye um, a couple of weeks ago. Bed Bath & Beyond has gone bankrupt. Uh, formerly a meme stock yeah. uh, during the good old days of, of 2020, 2021 as well. Um, you know, it's had to file for bankruptcy. Other thing that caught my eye, you know, the company spent more than eleven point eight billion buying back its own stock since since two thousand and four, which must be one of the most incredible uh, destructions of shareholder value of of all time. Um, simple question, you know, we talk, it's been it's been a hot topic over the past couple of years, democratization of investing and young people having access to investing and older people wagging their finger, going, "This will end in tears," and in some cases, it has. What what are your thoughts on that? Good or bad thing? Because I think that there are, there are two sides to the argument. Yeah, I mean, first of all, to defend my fellow youngsters, I would say age is no impediment to making a bad decision. I think we've all seen. <laughs> That's a very generous way of putting it. Yeah, everyone's capable of making a terrible decision. So I don't think youngsters getting pinned for using Robin Hood is any different to, you know. Your, your older cohort uh, going all in on some speculative mining company. So uh, that would be my first defense. But secondly, you know, these apps, you know, Robinhood, Webull, all of them, it's a net positive for the market insofar as it drives down execution costs, which is good for all market participants. So that would be, you know, the, the defense. But I I think, on the whole, I think the apps are very bad for the gamification, you know, the, the gambling argument. So when you go on one of these things and you click buy, it puffs, it puffs some confetti, yeah, which is totally against what it should be. It should go, remind yourself of the risk, you know, that that it, you should go into this thing. Very it's, it's, it's a really fine balance, isn't it? Because yeah. investing, good investing, should be pretty boring. Because mm. it indicates that you've got a decent asset allocation because you're not looking at it every two minutes. Yeah. If you're looking at it every two minutes, that's a usual decent indicator that you're probably taking on too much risk in terms of your asset allocation. Um, but you also want to get people interested. Yeah. And there's a lot of disengagement from the average young person, I would say, in the country. And actually finding some way to get them interested in investing is, is a good thing. And we had this moment in time where there's no football on, mm. you couldn't gamble, you had some money in your pocket because you literally couldn't go out and do anything. Yeah. And people people got into trading and yeah, you're going to make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. No one is a robot. If you're going to make mistakes, make them for goodness sake when you're young. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, the pound amount, and the pound amounts aren't, uh, aren't eye-watering. Um, Listen, there's good and bad things, but I, I just think that every generation has to learn, and maybe this was a learning moment for for the generation that are coming up. Well, I guess the, the only thing we can learn is that we never learn anything. Human I mean, look, look, at, look at speculative mania throughout history. You know, South Sea bubble, you know, Isaac Newton, I can predict the, the path of the planets, but not of men or you know, whatever the saying goes, but... You know, you've got the tulip mania, you, yeah. everything. We, we never learn, so that, that, that's the one thing I would say we've learned. Yeah, absolutely. We, we like to be part of our money pretty, pretty easily. <laughs> um, I think, ultimately, as long as you're not messing about with op- options, uh, for goodness sake, please don't do that. Mm. Um, but if you are... The, 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 the reduction in the cost of accessing capital market, it is still amazing to me that you can pop an app in your phone go and buy a market tracker, for example, and get access to some of the best business in the world at the click of a button. Yeah. I think that is a fa- fantastically positive thing for yeah. investors that we have seen over the past decades because you know, going to buy a stock you know, 20, 30 years ago, 3.5% commission probably, go in and actually see someone or phone someone up. You know, Actually, this does through the open the doors of investment to a lot more people, which is, I think, a, a, on the whole, a positive. Yeah, for sure. Um, but we're always going to make some mistakes, right? Always. It's part <laughs> of the fun. Part of the fun. Um, James, thank you so much. That was brilliant fun. Um, you'll have to come back and join us before soon. And it was our second attempt, so thank you for sticking about. <laughs> Anytime. Um, folks, thanks very much. Um, hope to see you next time in a couple of weeks when we'll have the usual gang back. 
Uh, in the meantime, if you have any questions, drop me a line at david.henry at culturechiviot.com. Thanks very much. <laughs>